Hey everyone, it was bound to happen sooner or later, no sooner than I got through posting the last video on the first part of gear setting. Um, in order to make room on my phone, I have to delete the previ previous videos, and I am uh, accidentally deleted the very first video that I made for the part two of gear setting. So I guess those things happen. It's not a big deal. I can recreate some of that like I'm gonna do here. Um, it'd have been nice to have it, but I don't have it, so we're just going to have to deal with it. Um, picking up where we left off, uh, last time we talked about getting the ring gear onto the locker, we talked about cleaning up shims, we talked about um, getting the pinion gear installed, the ho installed in the housing, which we did in the last video. So today um, we're going to pick up from there, we're going to get the carrier installed talk about how to adjust that and then start making adjustments between shims for the pinion and shims for the carrier so you can see how it all works together. What I was trying to talk to you guys about in that video that got deleted was about installing your carrier or your locker for the first time and getting shims on either side of it so you can have the appropriate amount of preload and you need uh, your preload and your backlash set correctly before you can run a pattern. So um, the next video picks up right as I'm getting ready to run a pattern. So uh, with that, imagine this being a locker or it could just be this carrier, that's fine. Imagine your ring gear going right there. The intent of the carrier is to be set in such a fashion that when you put shims on one side, it moves it one way. When you put shims on the other side, it moves it the other way. And what that does is it takes that ring gear, moves it side to side so it can mesh with that pinion gear. Very, very critical. So another way of uh, looking at this, let me pull this out. Imagine this is your carrier bearing. So you have your bearing, you have your race. It sits right in there just like that. So for the purpose of that, I'm gonna take the bearing out because it's gonna just fall out anyway. And so imagine your, your carrier, your bearing, everything sitting there. This needs to be moved this way, or sometimes it needs to be moved this way. And we accomplish that with those shims that you guys have in your, in your, uh, your master install kit. So if you look at an old shim like this, if I wanted to move the carrier that way, I would take a shim, I would slide it down in there, or actually I'd have it on the outside of the uh, carrier before I even try to put it in because you can't slide a shim in there that easily. And then what it's gonna do, let me see what this shim is. This shim is a 12 thousandths of an inch. It's gonna move the carrier 12 thousandths of an inch that way. That's how precise gear setting has to be in order to make this stuff uh, work properly. I mean, you can get it down to the 1 thousandth of an inch to make your gear set up perfect. So it gives you an idea of how uh, critical gear setting is and what it takes to get it done. So again, imagine, uh, well, let me back up just a second here. So on a, on a normal axle housing from the factory, when they set their gears, they have a whole wall of shims or a kit or whatever they have, and they have different thickness of master shims. So what they do is they figure out where that carrier needs to go and then they, um, they take that number of shims, say it is, you know, 87 thousandths. They'll take an 87 thousandths thick shim, put it on one side, and say the other side takes a, I don't know, 64 thousandths shim. And you end up with these two thick master shims on, on either side, and then they put the carrier in and they're done. They don't take time to mess with all these small shims and get everything just right. You know, you're talking big production stuff, they just have a wall of shims. They figure out what the um, um, spacing is going to need to be, and they do it that way. So those really thick shims, when you go to put your carrier in, you know, if they stick out just a little bit, say that you're putting your carrier in and that shim is sticking out that, you know, just a little bit like that, you can take a little uh, a wood block or a, a shim tool and you can tap it in gently until it goes all the way in. These thin shims... Not so much. You try tapping on it, the thing's gonna fold over and bend, or the backside's gonna bend, or it's gonna become um, distorted. So you need to be very, very careful if you're gonna have shims to the outside of the race. And um, 
and you're, you're trying to get it into the housing because it's a very high likelihood. If you, if you only have one shim this size, you're probably going to uh, have some, some trouble getting it in there straight. And that's where a case spreader comes uh, in handy is when you're dealing with really uh, thin shims. Now, the nice thing about the ARB is that it has two master shims, one for each side, and those are uh, right at a hundred thousandths, if I believe, or if I remember correctly. And you take your thinner shims and put them to the inside of that master shim. And then you can tap everything in gently and you have less problems that way. So that's how that works. Um, the, the missing video segment is no more than getting your carrier left to right the way it needs to be. And then we'll get it in there and run a pattern. Okay, a couple more things real quick. When you're installing your shims, you see this um, uh, right here, you have this oil um, slot that allows oil to get in there and lubricate the bearing. When you're putting your shim in, or I'm sorry, when you're putting your carrier in, sometimes that shim gets down into that slot right there. I'm not sure if you can see that or not. Let me come around and get you a closer look. That shim can get hung up in this slot as you're installing. So if you look at it from this direction, imagine your shim, your carrier, everything's getting pushed in, all of a sudden that shim falls in that slot. As you can see, it's not gonna go forward anymore. It has to be outside of that, into that slot right there, and then it can, it can go in like that. So when your race, your bearing and all that stuff's in there, you can see how that oil uh, hole to lubricate the bearings is there the slim the shim goes beyond that so make sure that you're paying attention for that stuff when you're installing if something gets hung up and you can't figure it out and you start tapping on your carrier your shim something like that you're going to bend them so be very very careful on that just want to check the backlash Spec is five to eight thousandths. I'm right at that eight thousandths mark, so I'm going to take a pattern and see where we're at. And that's going to let me know where the pinion's sitting right now. So that's up next. Okay, so we're going to take a pattern, get your gear marking compound. The key to this is thin is better. You want to paint the, the teeth. At this point, we're going to paint three teeth. So I'm gonna paint this side, then I'm gonna paint the other side. So you're getting both the coast and the drive side. So if you get in there, look, you're just painting, getting that stuff over there. So now if you can't hold enough pressure onto this, you may want to thin out your gear oil with a little bit of, I'm sorry, thin out your paint with a little bit of gear oil. So another trick that I do that people, I don't know, some, some people just can't figure it out, but to get a, a decent pattern, you have to have some resistance on your ring gear. I take a, a glove, I just hold right here, and I take a drill on this side with my socket. I'll rotate it around four or five times, and I'll push down pressure with this. And then I'll reverse it, come up here and do the same thing. That's all you gotta do. That'll apply enough pressure. You're not tearing up your hand. Life's good, so let's take a look, see what we have. Okay, good. All right, so first pattern, reading. You can tell that our pinion is too shallow, which is good, because I was worried about that uh, thick um, baffle being in there. 
So it's too shallow. And what it means is the pinion, let me find my, well, I guess it doesn't matter. The pinion head, so imagine on the other side, the pinion head is only sticking in about halfway or so, well, probably more than that, but we need to add more shims to get it to start driving in more. And then you're gonna see this pattern here start to move more towards the center and it's gonna work at an angle that way. So that's good information. We know that we need to adjust the pinion depth by adding more pinion shims. So we know right now that it's shallow. Let me rotate the other side. I wanna make sure you guys understand this. We know that it's shallow um, because we're not even barely on the tooth. We need that pattern to move this way. Uh, I probably shouldn't use that finger, huh? Anyway, we, uh, we need the pattern to move that way because right now it's barely making contact with the tip of that gear. So the way we do that is, if it's shallow, you need to add more shims behind that uh, race in there to push the pinion deeper into the gear set. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm gonna take this apart, make my adjustments, and see where we're at. The one thing I forgot to mention, so I just took my bearing caps off. The one thing I forgot to mention is, is when you go to add shims behind that race, you don't want to creep up on what the pattern's going to be. I'm gonna make a large adjustment in there. I wanna see change in a large fashion because that's gonna tell me Hey, I started off too shallow, now I saw it swung way over this way. Now I either need to back up or I'm really close on the side, but if I overshoot it, then I've effectively bracketed where I need to be for pinion depth. So by making a large change, it's going to uh, set my goalpost, so to speak, and then I can start narrowing it down until I get into a uh, perfect pattern. So again, you don't want to put 3,000 shim in there. You don't want to put a 5,000 shim in there because it's barely going to move it. And you may get to a point where you're like, oh, that looks good, and you could still be too shallow. I'm going to add 30 thousandths to that and see where it brings me. So just to be clear, in order to make your pinion depth change, carrier has to come out, then the pinion gear has to come out. We have to take everything apart so we can get those shims behind the cup. That's what's so frustrating about this. But that's kind of the fun part about this because I know that I'm working a puzzle. I found a certain piece, now I'm gonna move on to the next. The one thing that sucks is doing this pinion by hand. So I'm gonna use my impact wrench to get this off because that'll make things easy. right off you gotta be careful you don't want to beat the crap out of that thing you just want to force it through the bearing if you beat it I suppose you probably mushroom it there but just be careful now that bearing's still stuck in here now here's part of the frustration of doing gears with this pointed down I don't have to worry about the pinion falling out on the ground but if I hit it with the hammer to get this uh, uh, bearing the rest of the way off then the bearing could fall back out. So what I do, especially I'm not gonna damage my bearings, I hold the pinion head, and then I take my dead blow hammer, and I hold it as I get that. And then as the bearing starts to go, you'll feel it. And I hold the dead blow there so the bearing doesn't fall out. The bearing's here. Frustrating. Now the pinion comes out, reach in there, take your cup out. Of course, now it's just pain in the butt. I'm gonna add 30 thousandths. Uh, one of those shims is too big. Let's figure out which one it is. 20 thousandths fits. Oh, they just don't want to fit in there together for some reason. All right. Nope, they both fit and they fit good. Now this goes back in. If you can get it to go. That goes back on. 
This goes back in. You start the whole process over again. Now you can see why it's so frustrating. Don't forget to add your bearing. Bearing back in, make sure it's not going to try to fall off. Of course, I left my dead blow over there. Get my yoke in. Actually, I have enough threads already, so I don't even need to do that. So the nice thing about these uh, pinion nuts with the flange already built in, normally you have to um, dead blow that yoke in enough to get past the separate washer. With the washer being built in now, um, you can catch the threads. So that's kind of nice. If I can get it to go. Come on. There we go. Again, you don't want to over tighten yourself. If you're going to use an impact wrench, you better be careful. Yeah, they're still moving in there. We don't want that. There we go. Again, rotate your yoke to make sure that that bearing seated and it has just enough preload on there that uh, that's, that's going to be good to check with. Now that we've adjusted pinion depth, I'm going to go out on a limb here and guarantee that our backlash is going to change now. But I'm going to leave the shims exactly where they're at, and we're going to see. Ah. So again, ARB, you gotta be careful, you're not gonna smash the, the thing. So I put my thumb there because I know that I'm not gonna hit it. Last thing you wanna do. Very, very, very little backlash. I bet you we're down to that one to two thousandths again. Yes, I'm violating my order on putting my bearing caps on, but I just want to see if we're even close. Yeah, we don't even have barely one, so no need for that. Back out, start the process over. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull the carry out. I'm gonna take shims from this side, put them over to this side, and then we're gonna check it again. Okay, so I made my changes. Remember, 30 thousandths on the depth, that put it back quite a ways, and that's good. So if you look there, now you can see that I'm too deep. You see how that pattern gets way down the bottom, it has that harsh line, you have no gap at the top, um, there's no pattern diffusion, um, just way too deep. You can see right there, that's just out of there. So what I need to do now is pull it back apart. Now I'm gonna subtract shims to make it a little bit shallower. So I know now that my sweet spot's gonna be somewhere in between um, the none that I had in there before to 30 thousandths. And again, that doesn't include that 60 thou uh, slinger that was in there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go right in the middle of that 30 thousandths to 15 thousandths. That puts me right at 75. And usually 72 is about a good number for me that I've noticed in the past. Anywhere between 70 and 75 should be good. So let's go see what 75 looks like. Okay, so I dropped my pinion depth a little bit, got my backlash uh, at six. The spec again for this is five to eight. So six is kind of right in the middle there. Um, when you look at the pattern, most people would say, hey, that's an acceptable pattern, run it. When you look at the pattern on the back side, people say, hey, that's good, run it. Something's bothering me about it though. 
I think it is still just a touch too deep. So I'm gonna take out a couple thousandths of an inch and uh, rerun that and see what I get. And hopefully I get the thing dialed in perfectly. That's the goal. All right, so after jacking around with it for a bit, and I meant to put it on time-lapse. Sorry, I didn't do that. I thought I did, but I didn't push the start button like an idiot. Um, I found an acceptable pattern um, on both the drive side and the coast side. I could probably adjust my backlash maybe a thousandths of an inch in order to get it just absolutely primo, but right now I'm okay with it the way it is. Um, I need to install the final bearing race on the inside. So take out that setup bearing race, drive in the uh, final bearing race. Um, what I also need to do since I'm running this ARB is I have to uh, drill and tap my hole for the uh, bulkhead fitting so I can run my airline out over there. So that's what I'm gonna do next. And then uh, we'll be getting everything else ready to button it up. Almost got ahead of myself. I forgot that I have to adjust my pinion preload. So I'm gonna take this uh, setup race out of here. I'm gonna put in the new race. Naturally, that thing doesn't wanna go anywhere right now. So, seal driver, get it started as straight as you can because if it gets cockeyed, then it turns into a booger. And you'll know when you're home because you'll hear it bottom out. That's the bottom out sound. I'm gonna do one more time just to make sure she's home. You guys heard it? So now what I have to do, let me wipe this up real quick, get a little bit of gear oil on some things. So now what I have to do is I have to take these smaller shims. And these smaller shims go here. Now, if you recall this inner, I'm sorry, outer bearing, so this comes in from the backside over there, it will slide all the way on and push up against these shims. The question now is how many shims do I need in order to get my uh, preload for the bearings? I'm going to start with, uh, let's see here, 63, 73, 78 thou on this. And let's see where that puts us, and then we'll go from there. So. Okay, so that's starting to, to hammer down and that yoke is spinning freely. So I know we have too many shims on there, so we need to back off and figure out where we're gonna be. I'm gonna drop uh, a 21. And add a 27, that's after dropping that other one. So that's gonna be interesting. Let's see what this does. I forgot what I said I had last time. That's why it's important to write it down. Should be able to do the math in my head but half the time I'm doing it backwards. Still no resistance. There goes a FedEx truck. Hopefully it has Jeep parts. All right, so I found a number that with just the impact, and I don't know what that tightens to uh, foot pounds, but I have a decent feel right here. So I know I'm making progress I'm in the ballpark. 
but it does me no good to check my inch pounds until I get it torqued down to what it needs to be. Okay, that's right there at 180. Um, so that's telling me that we don't have enough preload. I'm guessing we don't have. I can feel it, it still feels light, but let's see. So the way you work this, you put your, your uh, torque wrench on and you watch the gauge here as you're spinning it. And as you're spinning it, you're gonna read the number. So it takes a little bit of practice to get to, I'm only at eight inch pounds right now. That's not enough. So the good news is I'm pretty damn close. Okay, so I put in, uh, let's see, 64. Let's see what I had over there. 63 was too much preload. 66 was too loose. That was only eight inch pounds. So I need between 63 and 66. So here's 64. And that gives me just about 19 inch pounds. Normally, I'd be good with that, but because they want between 10 and 15, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop it. So I'm gonna go with 65. 65 should be the magic number, let's see. All right, got that down with the impact. Let's tighten it with the torque wrench. Make sure we're where we need to be. Good, good. That's why you have to have a clean workspace. You're tripping over everything. All right. Make sure this still spins good. Doesn't feel bound up at all. Good, that feels good in the hand. All right, here we go. Hmm. Boy, right about 15, so 65 is my number. That is uh, awesome, glad to see that. Now, just so you know, um, 65 may or may not be your number. That number is arbitrary, it works with this axle. When you do your work, your number is gonna be what it's gonna be. There's no bearing on what my numbers are versus what yours are gonna be. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is take this apart. Drill tap for my bulkhead fitting for the ARB. I have to install my inner seals. I have to install the pinion back in with the uh, pinion seal. Get my final uh, pinion nut on there. I also have to put that uh, baffle on there. So plenty of work to be done. It's time to drill and tap the housing for the ARB bulkhead fitting. Now, when you look at places that it can go, you're kind of limited to this general area around here. And before you just go punch a mark some random place right in the middle, make sure you come around the other side and you take a look at what you're gonna have. So if you're gonna do, say a Dana 44, you're gonna have a little bit more room, but in this case, the Dana 30 here, it's gonna be a little bit different. So you see you have these little uh, recesses there when you think about where the upper control arm mount is at, this area is at, don't forget you're gonna have the locker in here with the ring gear here, so you have to make sure you stay out of the way of that. So your only option is pretty much in this area right through here. Now, looking at it, you'd say, okay, cool, this recessed area there, less stuff to drill through. This is thick, it's right by this uh, bolt, um, bolt hole there. But what is the best choice? Let's go take a look at my other one and I'll show you some issues that you can face while trying to do this. So first of all, let's go to the outside. That's where I, I ported it. It's about an inch and a quarter this way from the uh, mount, about an inch and a quarter, and then this way is about an inch. If you come around to the other side, I have the bearing caps in there, so that kind of gives you an idea of if you wanted to use that notch way over to the side, it, it would have been a good idea, except trying to get your line through there and back up. 
um, is uh, less than optimal. So I opted to drill through uh, this point right here and it does intersect with this hole. If, uh, let me see if I can get it to focus on there. Um, I haven't had any problems of anything leaking, but you can see my finger back there. It does uh, intersect with that, but it doesn't keep the uh, diff cover bolt from tightening up or anything like that. So keep that in mind when you drill yours, you choose your own location. I'm just trying to give you ideas of things to look out for when you go to do it. So I'm gonna go with the same location that I did last time because it worked out pretty well. I've not had any issues with it in all the years I've been running it. So I'm gonna measure over uh, just about an inch and a quarter, somewhere in there. And then from this side, I'm gonna measure over an inch. Make sure those cross. So I'm gonna drill there. Now when you go to tap for an ARB, the uh, hole you need to do is a 7 16 and then you're going to use um, quarter by 18 tap. Make sure you put oil on it. You're going to run it down, back it up every now and then, clean out the threads. You're just going to work it slow all the way through and make sure you get deep enough. You'll notice it's slightly tapered, so keep going. Um, try to fit your bulkhead fitting to uh, make sure that you can get it uh, screwed all the way down in with maybe one or two threads showing as all. So my suggestion for this is a pilot hole first. So whatever size drill bit you think is good, drill that first, then follow it up with the uh, 7 16 and then tap it. First thing you want to do, punch it. Get some oil on there. And when you're drilling, drill at a slow speed. You don't want to have that drill humming fast or you're going to just burn up your, your bit. Slow speed and some oil does wonders. Time to tap. Don't forget to put uh, oil on your threads. So that's getting sticky enough now that I'm gonna back this all the way out. Clean up the tap. Get my bulkhead fitting and see where I'm at. So the bulkhead fittings, 9 16 Teflon paste all the way around. Work it in there. You don't have to be snug, but you don't want to break it off because you can actually break this thing. Okay, we're going to move on to inner axle seals. Um, they go right in this little area right here. And if you notice this little orange thing there, a lot of people think that's some other type of seal that uh, is used in the housing that may need to be replaced, and it's not. This orange goop you see here is the uh, sealant that's used when they press the tube into the pumpkin. It comes out that other side is just excess. It doesn't need to be there. I like to take it off just because uh, it'll give me an opportunity to get my seal driver flat up against the uh, the uh, edge there and then I know when I got that thing set so I just take a little hook type thing you take whatever you want a razor blade or whatever and it just peels right out does not need to be there and then my driver now can fit in there all the way so I'll know when I get home with the seal 
When I'm putting in axle seals, what I do is I take a black pipe, I put it through the housing tube and it's a three quarter inch pipe. I get my seal started first with the hammer. I start getting it in there and then it's gonna probably get offset a little bit. But what I do is I take this uh, pipe, I put it here and I'm tall enough that I can hold the pipe here with one hand and uh, whack the end of the pipe with the hammer with the other one. You may not be, you may need a helper or you can use some other commercial seal driver or whatever. This is just, just what works for me. I always do the uh, short side first because then I can come back and I can use a short piece of pipe and I'm not worried about tearing up the seal like I would be if I was trying to push it all the way down the tube uh, on the long side. So that's it, pretty straightforward, goes in nice and easy. So it's going in good straight. So when you come in from the short side tube, a uh, three quarter inch pipe or, or something smaller will fit through that without damaging the seal. And that's the important part. You gotta be real careful that when you're doing this that you're not gonna damage the uh, seal. So in this case here, I have an old uh, threaded pipe that I use for this. And I could just set it right up against that. and get it uh, set. Let's see where we're at, not quite. There, you hear it? Seat right there. It's set. Assembly. One of the things uh, I do um, on the rear oil seal, I'll get some red tech grease and I'll just pack the lip right here a little bit. Um, the yoke will ride on this and it wears a groove in the metal of the yoke. Actually, it's kind of interesting to see that, but. I'll pack that and when I do this one, I also do the inner seals because the uh, axle shafts are the same thing. They'll wear on those. You get some premature wear if it's you know dry rubber on that. And it's just all right, we're gonna get the pinion seal in. So we have to first put in our bearing. Our baffle, then the uh, seal. And then after this is all set, we'll put the pinion uh, gear back through, hook up the yoke and go from there. So try to get this thing in as straight as you can. I wish I had a driver for this, but I don't. These things be a pain in the ass trying to find the sweet spot to start them. Make sure things seated the whole way. The nice thing about my pinion 30, if this uh, seal starts leaking, I can remove the seal, put another one back on, and I don't have to replace a crush sleeve. The shims are right there, just crank it right back down to what it's supposed to be at. So talking about the yoke, I don't know if you'll be able to see it here or not. but you'll get some wear marks right there and you could feel a little bit of a groove and uh, that can definitely uh, cause you a leak from that point or prematurely wear the seal. So wipe this up real good. And even though I packed the lip there with grease, I'm gonna rub a uh, thin coat around this just so it's uh, not gonna catch on anything. And 
be careful. Make sure all of your shims are there. Slowly coming up the back side. Line up your bearing, you gotta get through the bearing. So you gotta kind of move it around a little bit, just like that. Comes in just like that. Now the yoke, you wanna make sure you push smoothly through that seal. Make sure you change out your setup nut for your final nut. I got it to the point to where it's not really tight because I'm going to do it by hand now since it's the final setup. And again, I have my torque wrench set to about 190. Remember the spec on this says maximum of 260, so your call. So this feels a little more tight uh, than the original setup, which is normal because the seal adds some resistance as well. So I'm just gonna double check the rotating torque on this and see where we're at. So we were set at uh, 15. Now we are at 21, so another six inch pounds. But you can definitely tell the difference just by feeling it's kind of crazy. Time to get the carrier in, or the locker in this case. Uh, one of the first things I do is I squirt gear oil to the back side of that bearing, the uh, inner and outer. I put it through the little channel it has there just to get it some uh, lubrication prior to it running on a dry bearing. There we go. You can feel Okay, the one thing before you get going too far, if you're gonna run an ARB or whatever electronic lock you have, make sure that you get your seal housing in the right spot so you can get your airline over. If it's all the way down on this side, it's not gonna do you any good. So as I start to get this in, I'm gonna adjust that. Brass drift punch here would be better, but guess what I don't have? Sounds like everything's there. Here's a little homemade trick, I guess. Listen for the team. Solid. So, well, that first one wasn't. That one's solid. That one's solid. Now I know they're set. Again, double check your levers, make sure everything's going where it needs to be.
got to torque those still, but I'm going to work this first. And before I do that, I'm going to double check my backlash. Let me do that real quick. Since I'm here, Backlash is at six. Again, spec is five to eight. Um, you can adjust your backlash to get your pattern to change a little bit and then you're good. So there's no magic number, it's, it's based on your pattern. Okay. So again, be careful when you're bending this line, you wanna make sure you're keeping it clear of everything. In fact, let me get you channel I'm sorry a light so if you look in there you see how that copper line fits into that oil return channel there that way it's not going to get dinged up you want to make sure there's a space between the bearing cap and that copper line so you don't have any rubbing on it uh, that'll re uh, cause wear through that copper line. So you want to keep the copper line from touching anything, if at all possible, because that will cause unnecessary wear. All right. Luckily, my line's already bent for the most part that direction because it came out of my old housing. This is not a new ARB, obviously. Work some things here. Okay. Okay, so my copper tube, it's close to the uh, bearing cap, but it's not on it. Um, but I'm going to push it out a little bit anyway just to make sure I have uh, plenty of room. So i got plenty of room on the left side of it. And the, what I'm going to do is I'm going to back up the copper line with the screwdriver on this side so I'm not bending it at the actual seal housing. Because if you bend it at the seal housing, that can break and then you're having to get a new one. So I'm going to back it up there. Then I'm going to put this in here. Kind of bend it out a little bit to get away from that bearing cap. Again, this is copper, so be careful. Copper is really soft. Perfect. That runs up, that runs over, that goes there. Keep it uh, fresh, there we go. It's a little rubber O-ring. Now be careful of the edge of the uh, copper line. If you're doing an ARB in install for the very first time, the one thing I will tell you is be careful. These O-rings, um, they come out the new version now, so if you're, if you're gonna get the new version, you should be okay. But in this case here, you have to be uh, really careful about the O-ring with this copper line. When you cut this copper line to size that you need, make sure you take off any burrs and also open the hole back up because sometimes copper kind of folds over to there. So make sure you get your hole back and then get rid of those burrs on the outside so you're not tearing your copper O-ring. I'm back, just so you know, I took my ARB uh, copper line. There's another fitting that goes here that compresses that O-ring just a little bit. But I went ahead and put that on so I don't lose the O-ring. So that's sitting there. I have my copper line all um, worked where I want it to where it's not touching anything. It's not in the way of the ring gear when the ring gear spins. Um, so that's the way I need it. All I need to do now is torque down my bolts on a Dana 30 for a TJ. These are uh, 45 foot-pounds, which isn't a whole lot. Walt drill suck. And 
bingo. There we go. That looks good. More flashlight. Yep, that's what I want right there. I sold in real nice. So for me, the dry side of the teeth is the, uh, the more important of the one. Uh, that's kind of hard to see with these lights. Let me turn off this light. But you can see how you get that little sliver along the top side of the tooth. The pattern is centered. It's pretty diffuse. On the back side for the coast side, same thing. It's hard to see you because of the light but I am very, very good with that uh, pattern and I'm gonna run it.